From the studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. This week, I'm joined by David Joyner. David is an educator, author, and the executive director of online education and the online master of science and computer science at Georgia Tech's College of Computing. His research focuses on online education and learning at scale. David is the co-author of the recent book, The Distributed Classroom, the latest in a series on learning in large-scale environments, published by the MIT Press series editor, yours truly. The Distributed Classroom proposes a vision of the future of education in which the classroom experience is distributed across space and time without compromising learning. And we're excited to talk with David about his book today. David, welcome to Teach Lab. Thank you. It's great to be here. So you're the executive director of online education at the Georgia Tech College of Computing, uh, probably not a position that they had there 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, what is what is being the executive director of online education in a program like that mean? It's a position they didn't have two years ago, and they created it right before COVID hit, right before everything became online education, uh, which was fantastic timing or terrible timing, depending on whether or not you're the one in the role, which I am. Um, so yeah, uh, so most of what I do is um, I run our online master of science and computer science program. Uh, we started in 2014. Uh, we're up to 12,000 students as of this semester. Um, just finished graduating our, I think, ninth graduating class, which uh, took us to 6,500 graduates. So it's, um, it's we describe it as a MOOC-based master's degree, which is we're trying to take the lessons from massive open online courses and apply them to the four credit space. So we deliver a master's uh, degree, but online at scale in a way that lets us let anyone in who meets our minimum qualifications, no matter where in the world they are, um, everything like that. Uh, in addition to that, I also um, I teach our online undergraduate class. Uh, it's a CS1 class, uh, presupposes no prior computer science knowledge, um, which we developed to find out if we can extend the lessons we learned in the OMS CS program to the undergrad uh, level. Uh, that also exists as a massive open online course. Um, it's gotten, it's had about 5,000 students at Georgia Tech complete it, as well as about 15,000 in the, um, the MOOC version uh, complete it. What's novel about that one is that it's also the course we use um, to deliver our dual enrollment section of CS1. So we also have high school students from across the state who enroll in that class alongside um, current students uh, at Georgia Tech. And it's a fascinating experience because we've had you know, because we accommodate non-traditional students, I've had a semester where our youngest student was 15 or 16 and our oldest student was in their 70s. Uh, and they interact on the forum, they help each other out and never know, you know, that 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 big chasm exists. So it's been it's been fascinating. So most of what I do is run those programs, uh, teach those classes. Most of what I do is answer email, but that's because of the nature of what we do nowadays. So email, email and meetings. That's, yep. the, that's the week <laughs> of an academic. Um, so you have described these kinds of learning environments as distributed classrooms. What are the key features of distributed classrooms? So when we think of, when we talk about what we think of as the distributed classroom, we're kind of looking at where we've come from, which is that you know we have our online MSCS program, which exists at one far end of a spectrum. And then you have traditional learning environments, which exist kind of at the other end. Um, traditionally, you have all your students in a room together at the same time in the same place, and you can talk to them all live, you can inter interact with them all live. And then what we've kind of done over time is said, if you can't commit to being in Atlanta at 9 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, for you know 17 weeks at a time, then you go to this online version of this class, which is online, asynchronous. You don't have to be here at any given time. You can interact whenever you are uh, or whenever you're able to, to join. And that's great um, for, for accommodating a much broader set of learners. We have lots of people who can't commit to attending during work hours because they, you know, they're trying to transition jobs or something like that. We have lots of people who can't commit to normal hours because you know, childcare and things like that. So we're able to open it up to, to people who can't commit to the level of uh, in-person attendance and regular attendance that you need to to do an in-person uh, in -person program. But what's interesting about all that is that there's so much in the middle between those two extremes. So on the one extreme you have in a room together, same time, same place. On the other extreme you have on your own, whenever you want, whenever you want, uh, wherever you are. And there's so much we can do in between those two extremes uh, that we see with our, our students kind of forming things on their own. There's so many places where you'll have students who'll say, I can commit to attending synchronously. I can be online 9 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I just can't be in Atlanta. Uh, or you'll have students who say, you know, I can commit to a time, it just has to be a time after hours. 
And what that means is that there's this resource available. There's this structure available for different students that they can commit to that lets them preserve some of that in-person or some of that live interaction that's really valuable without going all the way to the extreme of a completely asynchronous experience just because they can't commit to being there in person. The distributed classroom is really about asking the question, can we take one classroom experience and distribute it across students who can commit to different levels of, uh, of attendance, different levels of in-person attendance, different levels of synchronous attendance, uh, things like that, such that you get to have as much of the experience as possible within your individual constraints. And what's nice about the modern, you know, the modern technology that we have is that more than ever, we're able, I think, to build an experience that actually distributed it across multiple uh, points in that spectrum instead of designing separate classes that are, this is the online section, this is the in-person section, this is the synchronous section. So that's what we talk about, or what we mean when we talk about a distributed classroom. So um, the book primarily uses the online master science program in computer science. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk about, so we could differentiate a little bit, um, what does this distributed classroom look like in CS1? Um, what are what are what are some of these sort of concrete examples of of middle spaces between fully in person and fully online that you can create for people who are just putting their foot in the door of computer science? Yeah, absolutely. So the the CS one actually is the best example of that because it um it's accommodating a slightly more traditional uh, audience. So what we have right now with CS one and in terms of its vanilla setup is it's an online experience. It's asynchronous. And that, quite honestly, that initially was done um, both for scale and for the fact that I think CS1 is just a really nice topic to teach online. Uh, it's it's such a practice oriented field. It's such a um, it's really about getting in the in the weeds on practice problems, actually doing some coding. It's not the traditional model of you know attend class for fifty minutes and then two days later try the homework. You can't really you can't learn CS that way. Um, so we, we built it that way. Um, if, the part, if the thing that you're trying to learn is how to sit in front of a computer and type stuff, um, yeah. it's a reasonable way to teach people to have them sit in front of a computer and learn to type stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I love the model that instead of it being, you know, I mean, we've all been in those classrooms where the teacher's teaching something and we were a little confused, but they're not going to stop because they, they can't just stop and not everybody in the class is confused or maybe some of us are bored. And it's really nice to have this environment where we can say, you know, you're going to learn for five minutes and then put it into practice for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes or two minutes, depending on what you individually need, because you're not sitting in a classroom with a bunch of other people, uh, all who have to be, uh, go on the same pace. Um, so we, we designed it with that, that kind of thing in mind. But what it's allowed us to do is create this kind of experience where when a student is able to commit to attending something in person, for example, we have an optional recitation that they can come to. They get some supplemental work. They get to talk to other people. They get to work through problems with classmates, work through problems with teaching assistants. Um, but if they can't, you know, attend that, then they're not locked out of the rest of the experience just because they can't be there uh, in person on campus. The place where that's been really interesting, though, has been um, in the past couple of years, as we've been forced to actually go more online uh, with that class, we found some things that we were able to do that really embody what this, I think this distributed classroom view is about. Uh, the first one was last fall, fall 2020. Um, there were a whole bunch of students who were going to come to Georgia Tech um, to, to start uh, their academic career uh, from China. And because the world was on fire, uh, they weren't able to, to come. And so instead of saying, you know, you just have to put off your enrollment for a year, our new campus at GT Shenzhen um, agreed to host them for, the, for that first semester. And they were able to take some classes uh, on the ground there, but they were actually able to take this class together with our students who were actually in Atlanta, as well as our students who would have been in Atlanta if, again, they could have come to campus, uh, all in kind of one big class. And what was really interesting that was there was that they were able to have their own recitation in Shenzhen, China, because of the, the, the climate, uh, the, the nature of um, the virus restrictions there at the time, they were actually able to have their own group of students meeting in person every week with their own teaching assistant, getting their own individual support, while they were officially enrolled in a class that was being delivered in Atlanta, you know, all the way across the world, because the nature of it allowed us to distribute a portion of the experience to, to wherever you happen to be. And if you are in a place where you have a cohort of classmates to, to talk with live, you're able, uh, you're able to do that. Uh, we've now extended that to our campus in Lorraine as well. And so in my class um, this semester, I've got students in both Georgia, uh, in Atlanta and in uh, GT Lorraine, um, Lorraine, France, where our, uh, our European campus is. And they're able to you know, interact in the same forum, talk with the same TAs, 
get the same support no matter where they um, where they happen to be. And then if they're in a place where they have several classmates, we can have dedicated on-ground uh, support for them. It's a model that I think has a lot of potential in other places as well, because we talk about a lot of classes that you really need, you know, a lab experience, or you need to be able to work on some physical prototype or something like that, that very often are the things that are very hard to teach, you know, remotely. But if you get to a point where you're able to say, all right, we don't you need everyone to be here in Atlanta. We just need you to have five people local to you and we can justify creating that physical you know, infrastructure for you to do what you need to do there. You can start to create these little pods of people all around the world who can get that social learning, get that classmate interaction and get that authentic experience, even though they're not able to be in Atlanta. Now, are there high schools that host cohorts like this? Um, do, are most of your high school enrollees for this class doing things on their own? Or in addition to folks in France and Shenzhen, do you also have people in different places in Georgia doing this together? Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great point. Um, we, so we do have a high school students who are dual enrollment students in the CS. Um, if I say CS1301, that's our official number for it, but it's a CS1 class. Um, so we have high school students around the state of Georgia who are part of the, the dual enrollment program who enroll in that class uh, as well. We have 80 of them uh, this semester alone. And it's actually, it's, it's a really nice experience there too, because the, the dual enrollment program in Georgia, and I'm sure in other states as well, is, has been around for ages, but it typically has such a high barrier to participation that you don't see nearly as much adoption as you could because it, you have to you know, require students who are high school students around the area to come to campus twice a week, which is, that's a big deal. It's a big commute. It means they can't be in, you know, there are other classes. It's not, you know, the usual model of I just walk across the hall and I'm at my next class. You, it's a big commitment. Because it's online, they're able to to join the class uh, when they wouldn't have been able to make those kind of um, commitments otherwise. And so we see students from a much broader range of counties across the um, the uh, across Georgia than we would see if we required the traditional um, kind of participation. Uh, generally speaking, we don't see uh, many schools that send us multiple students the same semester um, to the course. So there's not much happening at the individual schools right now. But that's something I'd really like to see us get toward because as this you know picks up and expands, there's no reason why you know Norcross High School up in uh, about 30 minutes north of Atlanta couldn't host an entire cohort of dual enrollment students all in the class together who could have their own teaching assistant dedicated to them because we can you know justify that if there's 20 students at the same school all enrolled at the same time. I'd love to see it get to that point. What we have seen is a couple of charter schools around the country have also started to offer their own sections of the course. Uh, and what they do is they use our material, but they hire their own teaching assistant and they handle their own grading and they handle everything like that on their own. But they're able to hire a teaching assistant who doesn't need to be on ground with their students because they're meeting online. And they're able to take advantage of our instructional content and all of our assessments, which are all uh, graded automatically. And so they can create a, a CS1 course without hiring an in-person CS teacher that leverages some proven material, some high quality material, and it also includes some human support without having to go out and find an actual CS teacher who can be in their classroom five days a week, because that's really hard to find. So that's the other thing I'm really excited about with that. It lets us distribute to places that can't have access to CS1 education otherwise. You know, in the earliest days of massive open online courses, one of the conversations that came up frequently was, is it better to understand a MOOC as a course or as a textbook? Mm -hmm. um, is it sort of the whole enchilada or is it really the sort of instructional materials? And it sounds like you're trying to sort of answer both. Like, <laughs> well, if you need us to provide the certification, if you need us to provide the registrarring, if you need us to provide the instruction, the grading, we can do all that. But also, if you just want our instructional materials, then we've built everything in, we've done two things. We've built everything in a way that you can just pick that up and take it. But also there's a sort of ethos behind it, which says like, we're here to serve as many learn, you know, as many learners as we possibly can, you know, instead of bragging about how many people we turn away, about how many people, you know, get rejected from the Georgia Tech um, College of Computing each year in the admission cycle, we're going to start bragging, you know, how many students around the state we can get Georgia Tech college credit in every given year. Are there, does that sound like a fair analysis or is there other ways that you would think about it? Oh, yeah. So I'm pretty sure you are actually in my office right now because I'm working on a paper. And that's exactly the section I wrote today was that, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there was an ethos in some colleges about, uh, it was the old uh, adage, look to your left, look to your right. One of the three of you will not graduate 
from this institute or won't be here next year. And at the time, that was considered a, a point of pride that we're so rigorous that we fail out one of our students. And fortunately, things changed. And now it's at the point where having a high retention rate is valued and it's part of, you know, what makes a, a college reputable and that goes into you know, all the rankings and things like that. But in return, what colleges do is they get more and more selective. So they're able to say, it's good that 97% of our students come in because we were really selective about who we wanted, you know, to have in, in the first place. But that's, you know, that locks so many people out uh, who were qualified for the experience and would have succeeded given the chance. Um, and that's that's been part of our, our, our mission with this is to make it so it should never be the case. You know, you should never be proud to reject someone who could have succeeded. You should try as, uh, to do whatever you can to accept everyone who has the potential to succeed. And that's kind of the, the, the foundation of that OMSCS program is that we let in anybody who meets our minimum bar. And as a result, our acceptance rate is something like 75, 80 percent. It's sky high. And we, we, we get in conversations with people who say, well, it can't be a reputable program if it lets 80 percent of people in. Why not? If those are the people who have the potential to succeed in the program, why wouldn't you let them in? And I'd rather let 10 people in who, who will ultimately not succeed than reject one person who would have, as long as we're not charging them an arm and a leg, which is the other defining feature of that master's program is that the tuition is, is extremely affordable. It's about $500 per class. Um, so, so we're able to give people the benefit of the doubt, give people a chance, because we also know we're not saddling them with five figures of debt just to enroll in one semester and then fail out. So in your book, The Distributed Classroom, one of the th things that you describe as defining feature of the distributed classroom is minimum necessary compromise. Um, what, what's minimum necessary compromise and how would you map it to the CS1 class that you've been describing for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a minimum necessary compromise as there exists this traditional experience where you're in the class with your classmates, with the teacher at the same time in the same place you know, regular schedule. And that's the structure. And, and there's a high cost associated with that. And that's the structure that locks so many people out. It locks them out either because they can't afford it, because they aren't competitive with the students who are going to get into the program, most likely because of, you know, what opportunities they've had earlier in life, um, or because they can't commit to that regularity because of other obligations they have, you know, taking care of family, everything like that. And so it says, what is the minimum part of that traditional experience you would have to give up to be able to participate in the class? Is it that all you have to do is give up coming to Atlanta, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m.? You can do everything else as long as you don't have to come to Atlanta. Um, it can be going to somewhere, you know, local in your city. If you live in New York, I'm, you know, you might be able to commit to going to a classroom in New York. It's not one, you know, uh, you can't move yourself to Atlanta uh, for access to that. Uh, or it could be, you know, you can commit to doing something synchronously at a given time every day, but it just can't be, you know, during work hours or it can't be during hours when you have your kids at home. It has to be, you know, after bedtime or something like that. And so it just asks the question, what's the minimum amount you have to give up to participate in that educational experience? If you can't be there at the same time on a regular schedule, what do you need to allow you to? And then in turn, what can we say about what you learned in the process anyway? Uh, so, and that's where... Um, the online master's program serves as a good example of it is that it gives the exact same credit. It gives the exact same diploma. Everything about is the same. They're you know, transferable. You can move credit from one campus to another um, if you choose to move to Atlanta later. Because we're able to say, despite the fact that you're compromising, despite the fact you're giving up attending in person, you're still doing the same assessments. You're still learning from the same faculty. You're still accomplishing the same you know, learning outcomes. And so we're comfortable giving you the same, the same credit. MOOCs actually give a good example of this as well, because MOOCs don't give academic credit. So in that case, it's a case of you're not able to commit to the tuition prices of you know, coming to campus. You're not able to commit to attending synchronously. You might not have the prerequisites. You might not have the prior qualifications. You might not, you know, if it's a, if it's a class that's offered as a graduate level class for credit and you don't have a bachelor's degree, you, you know, can't take it for credit there. But you're still able to commit to learning the content. And so you get some other kind of certificate out of the equation. So it's just what parts of the experience can you maintain? What parts can you commit to? And what can we say about your learning in exchange? And it's no longer the case that you have to be here for us to say anything about what you learned. What kind of expertise has Georgia Tech have to assemble in order to be able to generate these programs? Like what's been the, what's been the hardest thing for you and your colleagues to have to learn over the last few years to, to make these work? Oh gosh. Or, 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 were you, or were you sitting on top of all the expertise that you needed and just ended up deploying it in different ways? <laughs> no, I think it, it's been a really interesting experience because there's been a lot we had to learn, 
But a lot of what we had to learn was just how close we were in the first place. And so one of the one of the things actually in the book that is what comes up in conversation a lot is that we underestimate how distributed we already are. You know, as we've slowly shifted over the past 20 or 30 years towards relying on learning management systems and grading things and sending grades back via you know, those systems, answering questions on forums, having, you know, chat rooms and things like that for our classes, we've gravitated towards a, a place where we're actually very distributed in the first place. And so one of the things I try and help our faculty understand who are about to undertake developing a new class is that the majority of what you're going to do in teaching this class is not going to change when you go online. You can do the same projects. You can do the same assessments. Most things you can do pretty similarly because you're already so heavily relying on technology to distribute the experience you know, in the first place. We're not at a place anymore where you, know, you have to be in class to turn in your homework at the front of the, at the, front of the room at the end of class. We're at a place where we're submitting it online anyway. We're grading it. We're sending back grades online. So much of what we do is already well suited to this. This is the last step. It's not the first step. It's just saying that one thing that I'm still doing live and in person, now can I move that piece to, to a distributed kind of area? And I mean, over the past couple of years, we've seen everyone's kind of had to do that. So we've we've seen it's, you know, it's been under the worst conditions. So I think a lot of the, the negative experiences people have had have been because everyone had to do it on two weeks notice at the middle of, in the middle of the biggest crisis most of us have ever faced. But what we've been able to do, what we've been able to find is that we were already pretty close to there anyway. You know, if the pandemic had hit 10 years ago, I'm pretty sure schools would have just had, had to shut down for months instead of going to virtual learning for a while because we weren't at a place where we had the technological infrastructure to just have this last piece, you know, fall into, fall into place. One of the things that you mentioned was grading and assessments, and we should probably, um, for folks who haven't read the distributed classroom yet or don't know about the the online masters of science and computer science, you, you describe the course as MOOC based, but I think when most people think of MOOCs, they think, oh, so it's all auto graded problems. It's all just the computer will check my computer code or <laughs> it's all in, in, I mean, in many, many MOOCs, it's just all multiple choice or something like that. But this is one place where your program diverges quite substantially because to host these thousands and thousands of students every year, you know, by far the largest, um, master's program in computer science in the country. You're probably graduating something like 10 or 15% of all um, uh, uh, students who earn a master's degree in computer science a year. I mean, you all hire an army of teaching assistants every year. You've got something like 300 of them um, or something like that. Tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, it's sort of connected to this idea of minimum necessary compromise where you thought like, what is it that we want people to be able to do? Can we compromise on on human grading? No, we really can't. We're gonna have, yeah, we're gonna have to exactly. find a way to keep human grading because that's that's not a compromise we're willing to make. Yeah, no, exactly. That, that's exactly right. I'm glad you asked that too because I once had a, a conversation with somebody where we talked about the program for an hour. At the end of the conversation, he said, "Well, I, you know, it's it's great to hear you think you've had some success. I just don't think you can give a master's degree based on a bunch of multiple choice tests." I realized you've had this misconception about what we do this entire conversation that never came up because. For us, it's so fundamental that that isn't the way we work that we don't even often think of mentioning it. So you're right. We um, This semester, we employ uh, 450 teaching assistants. Um, for my classes alone, including my undergrad class, I have over 100. So I have more teaching assistants this semester than we had students the first semester I taught or co-taught a, a class in the program. If you, um, if you had had 50 more teaching assistants, it would have been a small business required to have a vaccine mandate um, <laughs> exactly. under the original proposal of the Biden administration. I mean, like yeah. you're basically running a business which is larger than a small business. Yeah, exactly. And that's the fascinating thing. So we, we've done some, uh, so my PhD student, Bobby Eicher, has done some research just to f try and find out, you know, because one of the, the things I think that makes our program great, if I do say so myself, is that our faculty have all the control over their own classes that they, they want. We're not, it's not this kind of model that I've seen from some, some, uh, from some other places where it's a very heavily, I don't want to say sanitized is almost the right word, where it's really delivered by a team of instructional designers instead of the faculty. You know, there's a lot of merits in, in that approach of having experts really take care of the day-to-day -day, um, experience. But I think what makes ours... That's, that's a lot of what you would find at for-profit online schools, or the largest online schools, where basically there's a team of instructional designers that build a course package, that build this kind of online textbook. And then you hire, as a different set of people, instructors who facilitate the learning experience 
Um, and, you know, probably in the worst of those circumstances, you basically have people who don't know the curriculum that well, just being there to vet people's assignments and sort of shuffle them through. In the best possible version of this, you could imagine that you're just, you know, giving different educators with different talents and strengths the ability to specialize. You know, if you don't have to do any curriculum design um, because someone's given you a really terrific curriculum, then you can just focus on the teaching and learning. But you're describing that, that, that that's not what you're doing there. Your faculty design the course, facilitate the course, but they facilitate the course with an army of up to 100 teaching assistants. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I think it's it's the case that at this level, if you're doing a graduate degree in computer science, the reason why you do that at a place like Georgia Tech is because you want to take classes from the people doing their research out the world. The people are right there on the cutting edge and you can bring in that expertise into the classroom as opposed to the more well-established classes where you can you know, grab the textbook off the shelf and know that this, this field, you know, it's like calculus, this field is well enough established that we can start to optimize the curriculum as opposed to just concentrating on making cutting edge content um, available. So, but yeah, so we hire, so we have 100, uh, 450 teaching assistants this semester and they are absolutely uh, incredible. So we had, um one of our early findings was that, you know, we didn't think that online students would be interested in being teaching assistants because we know they're mostly mid-career professionals. They have families. We don't pay competitively with what they make in their day job, obviously. Uh, and we don't even have the um, what we have for on-campus students, which is a tuition waiver, which is really the, the, the nice reason to be a teaching assistant is that you get free tuition. Our online students don't get that. And even if they did, the tuition is so you know so much lower that it's not worth nearly as uh, as much. So we didn't think online students would be willing to to be teaching assistants. We found out we were completely wrong. Uh, they love it. They flock to it. We turn away far more people than we can hire each semester, and they're better suited for the role than other students are because they actually know what it's like to be an online student. So they've been at home in their basement office working on their own. They know what it's like to ask a question on a forum and you know, have hours go by and not get an answer. They know how isolating that feels. And they bring that expertise to, to their role as a teaching assistant. So as a result, they end up being just, just fantastic at it. Um, and they and they also bring in the, that professional experience. So one of my TAs, he's uh, he is a teaching assistant for my uh, educational technology class. And he, as a professional background, has worked for several major, uh, at the executive level for several major textbook publishers. So he brings in an expertise in educational technology that goes far beyond what you would usually get from uh, a course staffed by the, the great students from the previous semester who are great people, but they don't have 20 and 30 year careers uh, in the field. And what's even more remarkable about that is he's been a TA for the class for seven years now. You know, on campus, you're a TA for maybe two or three semesters and then you, you graduate and you move on. Online, you never have to move on. We can hire alumni as teaching assistants. And now that's actually the almost the majority of our teaching assistants are alumni of the program who just want to stick around and continue helping out. And this is my roundabout way of saying, so as a result, the vast majority of work students do in the program is human graded. Uh, my PhD student, Bobby, did some research to try and find out, you know, what is the fraction of work that's project-based, what's homework-based, what's exam-based, what's human evaluated, what's AI evaluated, what's peer evaluated, because we know some, you know, MOOC programs and some other you know, degree programs use a lot of peer evaluation. And what she found was that 75% of the work that students do for their degree in our program is evaluated in whole or part by people. So not by an auto grader, not by a multiple choice thing. It's actually evaluating and graded by human graders. And where we do use automatic evaluation, it's very often you know, running code against real simulation kind of thing. So it's authentic to, to code. It's not auto graded for the sake of convenience, it's auto graded for the sake of that rapid feedback cycle uh, kind of thing. And so the, the human is still very heavily in the, in the loop in the program. And it's what makes the program, I think, so good and so much fun to work on because you really are working with a lot of really great people who bring this great diversity of perspectives and experiences to the classroom environment in a way you couldn't do if you weren't online in that scale. What are some of the either quality control or community building? Like how, how do you help your 100 TAs for CS1 be really good, be in sync with each other, those kinds of things. Yeah, so I, I should say um, for CS1, I actually have about 15 TAs. Um, oh, hundreds of TAs are for the, the graduate um, program. So I'd say that that's the other thing that's kind of interesting is that every class kind of has its own identity, its own community in a way that I think is part of what makes it uh, a, really, a really nice program because you're not getting this very 
sanitized kind of experience where every single class, everything is going to operate the exact same way, regardless of the affordances of the, the content. Um, the professors and the teaching assistants are able to tailor things to whatever works best for their own content, for what they want to accomplish in the class. And so, you know, I teach five, uh, four classes at the graduate level in addition to the, um, the undergrad class. And they all are actually pretty different. So one of them is heavily project-based where students propose their own project. One of them is heavily code-based where students are actually, you know, coding little mini projects to run against um, simulations. One of them is heavily essay-based where students write a whole lot during the semester. Actually, all my classes involve a lot of writing. So uh, that's just my, my bias as to what you should do at the graduate level. Um, but they're all different enough. And I think the way that those classes end up kind of facilitating their community really does come back to those teaching assistants that they have the the leeway in this environment to have a lot of impact on the class experience that you know they're they're there on the forums they're there in the chat they're there wherever the class is you know delivering its experience constantly managing and facilitating this this interaction with students and we're able to find people who are just fantastic at that so i think being the ta who is responsible for managing the the forum community is a very specific kind of role. And there are, there are individuals who are just fantastic about it. They, they're just such a positive presence that when they post, you can just feel the excitement coming you know, from that person. And it really comes back to the fact that we're able to bring in this diversity of people. We're able to bring in people who are, you know, you're a really cheerful, uplifting person. You're gonna be in front of students. You're gonna be active on the forum, answer questions, because everyone's gonna feel good having interacted with you. You, on the other hand, are a very rule-based, policy-based person. You're fantastic for running our plagiarism checks and making sure that students aren't copying essays from their repositories and things like that, because you're very detail-oriented. You're able to, you know, chase those cases down. You, you know, some other person, are great at getting a pile of papers and giving great feedback on them on time so students get that rapid uh, kind of feedback. In a traditional class, one person has to do all of those roles. When I you know, I just started teaching. I had to do plagiarism checks myself. I did a lot of grading myself. I was active on the forum myself. And what I found was that I'm I'm good at answering questions. I'm good at facilitating discussion on a forum. I apparently have that kind of you know excitement that comes through. I'm really not good at those other roles. You know, I, I, I I'm not detail oriented enough to follow through on some of the plagiarism checks and things like that. But we have this size that lets us find the exact right person for each individual task instead of forcing professors to, to wear every single possible hat to deliver a class in the first place. So David, you, I know you, and I think the book describes this as sort of optim, optimistic about this as a model, <laughs> um, which sort of deserves more consideration. And in this conversation, we've hit on a bunch of these things. You can just reach more people. Um, even if we were to stipulate, hey, not everybody likes online learning. Not everybody is well suited to this or that. Well, I think there's there's good research to believe all of these things. But there are all kinds of high school kids around Georgia who can't make it to Atlanta, mm -hmm. who can't arrange their schedule, who would really benefit from this. And so, you know, let's find those folks. Let's, you know, let's find working professionals who, who want to do this and that you're able to... Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I appreciate about the distributed classroom is that you know, the two, the two ways to think about large scale online learning, one of them is to say something like, you know, the ideal learning experience is a one on one tutorial and everything is worse than that. <laughs> and we just have to figure out how we can approximate it as closely as possible with computers or other things like that. But we'll never actually get there. Um, the other way to think about large scale learning is that, like, there may be things that we can do that are just better. Like, what you know, what if your teaching comes from not one person um, who's good at some things, but not others, but from a whole team of people who are all really good at the thing that they're focusing on. Um, there could be some really good outcomes for that. So, you know, March 2020, along comes a pandemic. Um, you know, courses all around the world have to shut down. Um, and, and certainly in those early days, I thought to myself, wow, you know, this could really be a moment in which, you know, massive open online courses, you know, or the way we've described these things is online. I mean, these could really break through in, in credit bearing higher education because the alternative to, you know, if, if, if someone somewhere is at a state university and they all got sent home in March of 2020, maybe they had to stay home in, in, in fall of 2020, like either, 
they have to sort of borrow something like the online master's of science in computer science and use that as the online textbook um, and have you know some kind of local facilitation. Or some professor who's never taught online before has to go like sit in front of their home office webcam and teach on Zoom, you know, with like two kids who are not in school crawling under their feet. Yep. Like, <laughs> it could it couldn't possibly be the case that you know having thousands of college faculty across the country basically by themselves invent courses on Zoom is better than using all of the existing resources that all the large scale learning folks have built over the last decade. Um, but that is exactly what happened. Yep. <laughs> exactly what happened, as far as I can tell, in almost every credit bearing organization of higher, I mean, you know, apparently zillions of people signed up for MOOCs, but I think there are mostly people sort of doing it for leisure time or because, you know, their work requirements changed or, you know, they had more time at home or something like that. Um, you know, but the, you know, the, the professor who's teaching microeconomics who had never taught online before, just like hopped in front of the, his webcam mm. and taught some crummy version of, you know, online zoom in a box microeconomics instead of taking you know, one of the many classes that, you know, edX or Coursera has built for hundreds of thousands of dollars and using those, what, you know, why, why wasn't the last couple of years sort of the big moment for those kinds of approaches for the distributed classroom? Like, is it a demand side problem? Is it because teacher, it's, it's like students really just want their own teacher? Is it uh, some kind of supply side problem? Like universities don't know how to take advantage of these resources. What do you, what do you see as the obstacles there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things because I think one of it, one part of it, I think there's an analogy to software engineering actually, which I'm a computer science person, so everything's an that's fair. To computing. Given, the, given the topic, <laughs> yep. But is that you know very often when you're talking to junior engineers and software developers, there's always a bias towards wanting to build something yourself as opposed to finding a library that that, that does it. And it's, I think something that we very often have to overcome um, is actually looking at the resources out there because it's that kind of thing where. I know the effort that's going to be required to teach on Zoom. So it's it's familiar, it's comfortable. Even if you've never taught on Zoom, you can kind of do an analogy of, okay, instead of teaching in front of class and putting my slides on the projector, I'll share my screen. And you can kind of pretty quickly figure out what it's going to be like. And it's it's known, it's familiar. You know what kind of time is going to be involved. Whereas going out and seeking other resources, you don't really know how long that's going to take. And it doesn't actually end up taking that long, but you don't know how long it's going to take. I mean, very often I think, choose the the thing that's familiar as opposed to the thing that's a little bit less familiar that could have ended up being better. Uh, we I think we always see this with the kind of tasks we streamline as well, that we, you know, we do something the hard way several times because we think it's going to take a while to learn a way to do it easier. And then we actually one day sit down and do it and realize that we've cost ourselves so much time over the years uh, by not doing it uh, the, what would have been the easier way just because the easier way involves some learning. So I think that's part of it, I think, is that it was the, the default option. It was known. It was people could kind of figure out what work was involved. I think there's also a um, a concern that if I'm teaching, you know, macroeconomics, for example, if I don't teach the material myself, if I go out and find videos from the internet, they're much better produced than what I could produce, but they're not mine. Then there's this fear that it's not really my class anymore, and students might not respect me as the the authority. The the school might not respect the idea that this is my class, and then there's this kind of possessiveness and insecurity about if I'm not the one presenting it, then it's not mine. And I think that's that's not an unreasonable thing to to feel. Uh, I think one of the models that we saw, uh, at least at Georgia Tech, I'm sure other schools found it too. That I think is it's my favorite model of um, of some of this uh, this approach is when faculty would they take you know videos and they take course material from Coursera and edX and YouTube and Khan Academy and all the different places that are doing so much great work to make material publicly available and they'd use it but they wouldn't just plop it in and say you know all right this week you're going to watch lesson 5 from this Coursera course on macroeconomics instead they would say you know hey everybody welcome to this week of this course this week here's what I want you to do I want you to watch this content from this place and here's what I want you to pick up on this cuz this is going to connect to what we're going to do next week and I call it the hosted model just because it reminds me of a talk show host of, you know, introducing different segments and things like that, where they are, they're still the guide to the course. They're still the arbiter. They're still the person who is ushering you through this course. They're just not the person who has to be the sole font of knowledge for everything, but they still play a very, uh, a very significant role. I think it is the kind of thing that it's just, if you're first getting into the environment, you don't know how much work you're going to have to put in to make that kind of experience happen. But once you've done it, you find it's actually 
not nearly as difficult as, as you would anticipate. And it's also quite maintainable. So it's the kind of thing where you're able to then the following semester follow up and reuse a lot more than you would have reused otherwise because the videos haven't gone anywhere. But it's not what we very often have in Luke World as well, which is once it's produced, maintaining anything is really difficult because you know you have to ramp up the studio space and find your your video editor and everything like that again. You're still doing something pretty, you know, lightweight and organic with it. So you can then say, this semester, actually, I think I'd like to add this lesson, remove that lesson, or add some more content here in a much you know easier kind of fashion while still taking advantage of these great resources that are that are already available online. That's great. I think those are great sort of supply side arguments, kind of why faculty didn't go this direction. I, I'm really interested in the sort of demand side piece, which is that, you know, if if the argument that the sort of polished online materials are really better than what people can hack together, it seems to me there would have been in various places kind of student uprisings. Um, <laughs> hey, like, why do I have to take this lousy class that this guy is just doing his lectures online and we're sitting on Zoom when I know from my other life experiences that there are these really good online classes that we could be taking advantage of? Um, and I, I have not heard yet of that sort of design side demand side sort of surge of interest, which also makes me think that there's a bias from students too, um, that, that people actually want to be taught um, by a person that they have some some affinity with, some connection to. Like if I signed up to go to Penn State or SUNY Buffalo or ASU, I actually want a professor from Penn State or SUNY Buffalo or ASU um, because they're part of my team and they're part of my tribe and part of my community and things like that. Um, but I think some of what you describe in the distributed classroom sort of like in the long run potentially addresses some of that in the sense that, um, you know, a big part of what you, you are building are these communities. Like, you know, the, the courses that you're creating are not libraries of videos, you know, with, with projects that people check, um, but, but a living community of people that are helping each other and supporting each other. So if, if you could put yourself in front of the Secretary of Education of the state of Georgia um, and say... I think some of these ideas really have some legs for K twelve. Um, what what would you what would you say to the whoever is the commissioner of K through twelve education in Georgia? What do you what do you think uh, middle schools high schools can learn from the experiences that you all have had at Georgia Tech? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing that so I should say high school does present some very different challenges in middle school, obviously. Uh, as well, in the sense that, you know, one of the key defining factors behind what we've done in the MSCS program is this idea of, you know, for this class, there's only a couple dozen people in the entire world who can teach this material. So naturally, we have to scale up how many people that person can teach because we're not going to find other people. At the high school level, you kind of have a, a sometimes a different uh, a different equation with things like you know, calculus and English and, and history, where the supply of teachers is a much bigger pipeline of people, you know, coming in to to, to teach that. The question then becomes, what can we do with these kind of technologies and experiences to improve the outcomes of students? And right now, you know, I, I think teaching is one of the hardest jobs in the world because teachers are forced to play so many different functional roles. And I can't think of any other, any other role in the world where the same person has to be, you know, the, the person who knows all the content, the person who can give good individual feedback, the person who can monitor progress, the person who can also take care of, you know, handle students' mental, you know, struggles, the stress that goes along with things, but also be the disciplinarian, to, to play all those kind of roles all at the same time. I mean, it's the reason why, you know, when we talk about things like intelligent tutoring systems, we say, are we going to replace teachers with AI? No, because if we can place teachers with AI, we've lost, every, we've run out of things to teach because that's the hardest thing that would be to, you know, for an AI to do is to teach. So... That notion of the job of a K-12 teacher becoming increasingly, like having been impossible for a while and becoming increasingly impossible, um, I, I think really resonates when we think about all that we're asking to teachers to do to be advisors, coaches, subject efforts, graders, curriculum designers. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a list of demands which mere mortals can't do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and... There are good reasons to want schools to be more complex and sophisticated in some ways. Like the world is more complex. There's more knowledge that people need to be successful. Um, but we're not going to be able to have our schooling systems produce 
better educated, more well-rounded, more specialized students just by asking the teachers who work in them to be able to do more and more and more. Oh yeah. Well, David, it's been terrific having you here on Teach Lab. Um, really appreciate uh, the, the work that you're doing to share this model with the world. And I think it's exciting to see how it'll continue to grow and change and how we can learn from it in the future. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be here. I'm always excited to share some of what we do just because I, whenever we have these kind of conversations, I realize things that we're doing that are novel that don't feel novel to us because we, we do them every day. But then we have a conversation and find out that idea that you know we take for granted is something that the world can use. So I, I love having these conversations. It's great. David Joyner, he's the Executive Director of Online Education and the Online Master of Science and Computer Science at Georgia Tech's College of Computing. And he's the author of the recent book, The Distributed Classroom, from the Learning in Large-Scale Environments series published by the MIT Press. I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Be sure to subscribe to Teach Lab so you don't miss any episodes from our new season. In today's show notes, you'll find a link to David's book, The Distributed Classroom, and his website, along with a link to my book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, if you'd like to dig deeper into what we talked about today. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe until next time.